address them all. Once again, a thank you very much to you, Jeff and Rodney, and over to you, Jeff. Take it away. Thanks. Thank you, guys. First of all, um, thank you very much for inviting me. I feel quite honored. There are a lot of property players out there in this country, and to be selected to talk to the same panel as, as a friend of a long, long, long time ago, Rodney, uh, I feel I feel honored. Um, so before I start, I, I just want to set some ground rules um, uh, in the sense that as that I, uh, the property that we run, the type of portfolios that we run are very different. When people talk about property, this is how the property game, I always have to remind them that property is a very big word. Um, the big differentiator, I think there's the listed sector and there's the unlisted sector. And within each sector, we have um, within type, within each type, we have different different sectors. So the ones that we are involved in um, are the residential, which very few of the listed players are, but there are are, are two or three of us that that play in that place. We do retail. Uh, I call it high street shopping, um, as well as some shopping centres. Not big into malls. We're not mall experts. Um, offices. We do do offices, but not the typical offices that most people are accustomed to. We, we, we play in the CBD. Uh, we still, for our sins, uh, play with government, um, which, by the way, seems to have, at this stage anyway, seems to have worked out well for us. And we have a, a, a fairly old industrial sector, um, but, but more, more of that a little bit later. Um, the other thing I want to say is, 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 that, is that we are different. We play differently. I like to consider myself and the team that I work with as, as property purists. If you have a look at, at the listed sector, you're going to find some very, 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 very smart um, uh, corporate bankers, deal makers. Um, we, 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 we're not that kind. We, we, we simple people from Pretoria, whereby um, we got rental uh, and from that rental, we got expenses. Um, like all property people, you, to make a bit of money in, in, in property, you, you need a bit of gearing. So there's an interest charge. And that's, by and large, in summary, the, the, the income statement. Um, and so I, I would like to, um, I would like to perhaps kick off. Um, I, I received a, a, a note from, from the organizers to kick off by, by talking a little bit about one or two stories um, that will indicate certainly um, how I was formed, how I was trained. And the first story, it's a bit lighthearted, but it's very serious. Um, I, was, I was a young child, um, a young boy, eating, uh, staying at home with my parents. And my mother popped up and piped up and said, do you know what, there's this crazy man buying, buying property around Brooklyn Square. He's crazy, he's mad. Those are old, old philopaters. And uh, that was the end of it. I thought that was my mother's book club story. That was the Aggie Fall for that, for that book club. Eventually, a, a week later, um, I, my dad could take it no more, the pressure no more, and said to us, you know, that mad madman that was buying the properties, this was, this was me. Um, he, 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 he had bought uh, the, the, the buildings around Brooklyn Square, which, which later went on to be developed into, um, into the Brooklyn Shopping Centre, probably one of the best shopping centres, um, in, certainly in Pretoria. Um, and, and, and I often reflect on that. And, and, and I think, how does a guy move into an area that was completely, completely residential, one or two... Uh, basic shops in the area, old, old, dirty shops, and everybody seemed happy. What did he see that 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 nobody else saw enabled him to move before the rest of the market? And that's a question that I think about a lot or thought about a lot. And one of the things he knew, he knew the area, he knew the area well, he knew the surrounding area uh, 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 well, he knew he knew that that it was growing. He saw a movement. I think even in those days from the center of town towards the east, towards in that stage, it was Brooklyn. And he realized there's got to be a demand for a shopping center. Armed with that incredible knowledge, he went ahead and put down, I forget the cost, uh, but he put down a, a, a shopping center, I think about 45,000 um, square meters. 
So, so that was my first thing, is, is, is know, 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 know your market, know the demand, know what the people in the area want. Don't give people what you think that they want, or don't give people what you can deliver. Give them what they want. He knew, he had spoken to enough people. We lived very close by there. In fact, I grew up in Brooklyn um, uh, for the pre, pre bar mitzvah years. So he knew the area well. So that's, 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 that's the first story. Um, that I want, I want, I want to, I want to, I want to say, and, and and I think it's important. Anybody thinking of getting into property, don't just go into property. I, I, I want without having had these kind of thoughts. The other, the other thing that uh, I think is is um, is 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 worthwhile uh, cautioning people, and that is we are coming out. Let's not forget our memories are sometimes short. A time where certainly in the listed sector, it was property on steroids. The share price just kept going up, up, up for whatever reason, and 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 I think that um, people climbed on this bandwagon, and and some some guys made a lot of money without really understanding. Um, you know, I, I don't know who it was, but one said, "When but when the tide goes out, we will find those not wearing that that haven't got their pants on or something to that effect." Um, and and I think that's what we may be seeing some of uh, today. So um, that's, that's, that's the one story. Um, my late father got that call right. Uh, the other story was uh, I was in the, uh, uh, when, when, when um, uh, in fact, they're, they're, they're related because uh, there was a, a hostile takeover and my family lost control over, over, over Brooklyn Mall and that through a series of, of corporate transactions landed up in, in, in the growth point portfolio. And it's in the fair today. Uh, but in, in, in the management company, the management company that I run today called City Property, uh, we effectively, because we had lost uh, Brooklyn Mall and one or two other shopping centers with it, uh, we had lost approximately a third of our business. And once again, my old man, who, who, who was a, um, a visionary, he could anticipate, not because he, he was a, a prophet, it's because he knew the market. He realized that there was value. He has the next uh, lesson, that, that he was a value seeker. Um, if something was really dirt cheap, well, well, look at it very, very, very carefully. And he said, he, he said to me, he came in, I sat in his office. I remember this so well. He said to me, I don't know what we, I know what we're going to do. We've lost a, a third of our business through the loss of, of, of um, Brooklyn Mall. At the time, it was housed in something called Richway. For those that are interested, um, but we're going to take this money, and it was the first time that the family had had spare cash, and we're going to buy in the CBD, and that's what he did. Um, I, I I remember so clearly the value that he was acquiring buildings for a million rand, uh, six seven thousand square meters plus parking for two million rand, and that 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 is something else that I, I can't forget. Maybe we are heading towards those days. Uh, maybe not. I think a lot of a lot of this um, relates, perhaps, to our own individual assessments on the future of, of of South Africa. But if the future is good, um, there's going to be um, a lot of wealth made during times like uh, uncertain times like we're experiencing today. And so the second story I, I want to tell you is a story about myself, where um, when I first started, my father, we had one building, believe it or not, one building that. That's when I started. We had one residential building that was 100% owned by my family, but it wasn't a good performing building. And it was a block of flats with some shops underneath. And I went to, I, I, in my, my, my late father came up to me and he said to me, um, you take over it. You take, you see what you can do. And I battled, I battled. I remember my wife used to phone me on, at that stage, cell phones were out. My wife used to phone me and used to say to me, Jeffrey, where are you? And I used to say, I'm at this, this building. And uh, she, she coined a phrase and says, it's your pet building. And, and then afterwards, she used to phone me and used to say, where are you? And I used to say to her, <laughs> at my pet building. And, and that's how she knew where I was. Um, but eventually, and this was a big day in my own personal life, my own development. Uh, I, I remember this was early 90s. Um, I walked out of the building and a, and, a, and a man, a black man came up to me and he says, I need a flat. He says, I'm a doctor, I work in town. I've got to leave home at three o'clock in the morning to be at the hospital. 
Um, and and I, I, I miss my family, but on Friday I go back and I have a long journey home. I need, can't you give me a flat here? And, 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 that's, and, and, and in that instance, I thought this is something I have to do because the man is black, why can't I, why can't I give him a flat? And I did it and I, I, I guess I had to face the music when I came back to the office and tell people what I'd done. Um, but ooh, there were learnings there. And, and that was, I discovered that I could fix up this flat because I realized I can't give this educated man this, this, this empty flat that I had. It was in a terrible condition. I don't think any of, any of the flats in this particular building were fixed up. And, and I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't technical. Um, but through a little bit of effort and not a hell of a lot of money, I could fix up the flat and put it into condition um, that has the important thing. I myself would be happy to live in with, with, my, with, my, with my own um, family. And, and, that's what, and that's what we did. Um, uh, he moved in. There was, a, there was a friendship that developed because I'd helped him. And he brought all his friends. And within, I don't know, within six to three to six months, this building was full. It, it was full of, of, of medical, medical uh, people, nurses, doctors, um, and, and one or two others. And all of a sudden, for the first time, this, this building became a, a cash cow. But I, I, so besides the technical stuff I'd learned, I'd also learned something else. I learned that there is um, that 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 everybody knows the difference between between nice and and and, and not nice, between ugly, being pretty and ugly, between fixed and broken, between well maintained and badly maintained. And hey, guess what, guys? We all prefer the former to the latter. And so that 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 changed the way that I who, who then got involved a lot of in a lot of residential. Um, what I did, and all of a sudden, I realized that this huge market, and here was something else that I was learning, this huge market that was starting then to migrate from the urban into the, uh, from the rural into the urban areas was, 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 was an enormous market, and that was something that we needed to tap into. The knee-jerk reaction at the, at the time, for those of you that weren't around in the early 90s, was that, gosh, these guys are not going to pay rent, these guys are going to smash and break the place, and you won't kick them out. Well, I can tell you this to this day, uh, none of the above. Um, and, 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 and so that's, that is something that I've, that, that, that I've done. I've inculcated into the, into my, in, into, into the wonderful team that I work with, uh, not only in residential, but also in commercial, into retail. Um, just two words about retail. Um, Nobody was investing anything in the retail. And I decided, well, let's apply what we've learned in residential. Let's go apply it in, in retail. And all these buildings we fixed up. To fix up a retail shop is not a big deal. Change the shop front, put in a coat of paint, uh, strip out the old floor. And all of a sudden, I started finding that the nationals started moving into our buildings. They were happy to put their badges onto, onto our buildings. And uh, I, I guess the, the, the rest is, is, is history. Um, I'm going to I'm going to keep quiet now. I think Rodney perhaps has a bigger story than I have. Um, um, Rodney, just before I ask you to share your story, uh, Jeff, why did your father I'm saying start in property? What was the rationale for him, you know, investing in property? Has there been so, so but yeah, but by, by trade he was an accountant. I don't think he was a great accountant. Certainly didn't stimulate him, but he was in partnership with somebody. And, 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 and he was struggling. He had three kids, myself and my two sisters. And, and the way he, he realized he could make money was he would do syndicates. Um, he didn't put money in, but he didn't charge fees to the syndicate either, uh, sort of putting a together fee. Um, he, didn't, he didn't do that, um, but took a small interest in the property. There's perhaps some more wisdom that you don't have to go big. Um, and and uh, he would then carry on to do the books. And in 1968, he decided auditing is not for him. Um, he prefers the running of 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 city property, which is our our, um, our our management company. What then happened? All these all these syndicates got rolled up and rolled up and rolled up and rolled up. That's a long story on its own. No time tonight. But eventually, he landed up into one of the one of the smaller, not one of the bigger, uh, listed REITs today called Octodeck. Amazing. Thanks for that. Thanks for sharing that. Really insightful. And uh, I guess, Rodney, over to you. Okay. Thanks. Can you guys hear me? 
Yeah, perfectly. Um, yeah, well, firstly, thanks also for inviting me. Uh, it's a serious honor, um, being that I've been out of South Africa for, for quite a while. Um, I'm going to give you some background to basically follow the format that you asked for. And I've prepared something quite formally, so I'm going to read it if you don't mind. And then you can ask me the questions as you want to. Um, essentially, I come from a family with diverse business interests. Uh, they range from farming, selling agricultural and veterinary products, to a distillery on an owner-occupied property and a chain of retail outlets. I had no interest in joining our family business and having to deal with the family politics that I witnessed when I was growing up. My early passion for maths and physics led me to study civil and structural engineering, and I qualified at WITS in 1976. I spent the next 18 years in the profession, and I gained diverse experience in all the technical aspects of the property development industry across most sectors and in many markets. I'd like to share some of the lessons I learned along the way that might be useful. Early in my career, I joined a small consultancy as head of their design office, where I realized the value of a can-do attitude and a disciplined work ethic. My boss loaded me with more and more responsibility, which I willingly accepted, and I worked extremely long hours in a six day weeks more often than not to get through the workload to the point where he was largely reliant on me for the firm's operational success. When it came to my remuneration review at the end of the first year, having made myself indispensable, I was able to negotiate a 20% partnership stake and an increase in monthly salary of three times. Later in my consultancy, um, which I'd set up by then on my own, I realized that a small practice was actually unviable as the workload was unreliable and the fees were insufficient to bridge the cash flow troughs. I had to find a way of overcoming this and I wasn't keen to work for anybody else. By combining all the professional disciplines under one roof and adopting an integrated multidisciplinary design approach, which wasn't the norm at the time, I realized I could potentially offer a much more rapid design turnaround time and a better surface. I could increase my workload capacity and I could compete for larger projects and increase my reserves. I could also potentially offer reduced fees for package rollout appointments, which would likely get the attention from the private developers. Total professional fees at the time accounted for about 10 to 11% of the costs of industrial projects, of which about 3% only was allocated to the structural and civil engineering portions. So clearly a financial opportunity existed if streamlining was possible, despite the increased overhead burden. This proved to be the case, and I was able to secure a steady rollout of projects and build up decent reserves. The lesson here is that innovation in the face of seemingly well-established practice is always possible and should be high on the agenda. Also, what at face value seems unprofitable may with critical review and an alternative approach actually be profitable. The success of the multidisciplinary approach that evolved naturally with the emergence of project management as a specialized discipline, which I adopted relatively early on. I was able to offer developers a one-stop service for the delivery of projects from concept through to handover. This represented enormous value add to them from a de-risking perspective particularly, albeit we would be assuming more than the usual risk. I had a thorough understanding of the pricing and procurement supply chain and realized that there was room for streamlining by adopting procurement pricing and payment strategies to bring down the costs. I also realized that this could be the gateway for me to becoming a co-developer by demonstrating the value add benefit. This turned out also to be so, and many projects were implemented on this base and allowed me to start building a capital base. The lesson here is that it proved that a startup type innovation attitude with measured risk acceptance founded on comprehensive knowledge combined with excellence in implementation can yield hidden value and untapped opportunity, even in established markets. After a few years of doing projects with private developers, my accountant suggested that I needed formal exposure to the institutional space if I was to be able to migrate to attracting institutional capital for larger developments, which was needed. This meant my becoming an employee again and not having the latitude to add value for personal gain. At face value, a backward step for me. On reflection, I realized this advice was sound in the long term. And since the skill set I'd developed over time was diverse, it made me very marketable. Not long thereafter, I accepted an offer to head up a development subsidiary of a company mandated on a large industrial portfolio. And I spent six years repositioning and developing many properties for them and learned the ins and outs of the institutional long-term investment space and gained a comprehensive understanding of the market dynamics. Whilst giving up my independence initially was a tough choice and enabled my access into the property Premier League. By the time I left there, I had a solid track record as a developer 
and felt confident to be able to make the leap to investor. The lesson here is that sometimes one needs to take a step backwards to secure the future, and the longer path may well be the, the correct path. In 1994, I partnered with a wealthy private investor who cashed in some of his investments and was wanting to develop an income producing commercial property portfolio. I negotiated a decent equity carry and management contract, and over the next four years, developed and managed a small but prime portfolio leased on long leases to solid covenants. In 1998, when the interest rate spike hit, we decided it was a good time to exit and curtail our development activities. We sold the prime assets to the newly formed Zenprop, which was a few months old at that point, and they subsequently asked me to join them as joint CEO with responsibility to grow assets through development. They offered a meaningful equity stake in the business and a sizable balance sheet. And the lesson here is that with the thorough knowledge that I'd gained and reputation that I developed over the time, I was highly, highly marketable. On to the Zenprop story. So Zenprop started its business in April 98 at the time of the interest rate spike at what in hindsight was near perfect timing to get into property. Costs of conventional debt was high, vacancies were high, and institutional investors were actively divesting their assets at bargain prices to reduce their property exposure ratios as required by newly adopted investing criteria. The opportunity was recognized by our seed funder, Dr. Baer at the time, and the mandate was to develop a long-term sustainable investment portfolio. The notion was to take advantage of prevailing market conditions, use structured finance and assemble a portfolio rapidly. In the period from inception to 2006, property yields halved, so values doubled. One doesn't have to be too smart to understand the percentage equity growth achieved during this time with high initial gearing and rental escalations. The development strategy adopted had a simple core focus, and this gets to what Jeff mentioned about being a, a property guy. And we targeted premium investment grade clients to offer them bespoke best in category product in the corporate office and corporate industrial and warehouse sectors in prime loads at competitive market related prices. Our USP was to be excellence in design and space use innovation, a service culture ethos and close personal relationships. Being that the approach of the historical dominant players in the markets was uninspiring, to be generous, we were able to rapidly gain traction with our energetic dynamic approach. The core of the strategy was that sustainability is inherently secured in best in class properties, as they will always be more attractive to tenants than the competitor offerings, provided pricing is comparative. In this way, high occupancy rates are assured, which is the lifeblood of property investment. The strategy has proven itself time and again, and is worth remembering. Our strategy for buying existing buildings, which my partner Evan led at the time, was to target purchase and lease backs for investment grade covenants. Nodes were not necessarily prime, buildings were not necessarily fantastic, and they were generally of varying ages, but generally well-maintained. This opportunity took advantage of the rapidly compressing yield curve cycle and was opportunistic at the time. It was more of a financial play than a bricks and mortar play and was highly successful whilst the cycle lasted and whilst there were willing qualified sellers. This type of opportunity, I believe may well be arising again with yields being as high as they are now and represents an, op an entrepreneurial opportunity. From the outset, we hired best in-house technical professionals. Most of the key hires were people I'd worked with extensively during my career and with whom I had a high level of mutual respect and trust and was aware of their technical competence. This is another good lesson. Work with people who are honest and who you trust and respect. They will take an enormous burden off your shoulders and allow you to focus on your core activities. Since 2010, my efforts have largely been focused building the offshore business and providing mentoring and strategic guidance and design review oversight to the SA team. The SA team today is undoubtedly one of the most skilled and effective I've come across anywhere in the world. And I'm extremely proud of what they've achieved under James Tannenberger's leadership for the past 10 years. Regarding the UK business, we undertook extensive development of retail centers in Germany between 2010 and 2015. And we also invested in a portfolio of large hotels, which was, was redeveloped and unsold. In those markets, the added values largely achieve the smart capital structures, which allow boosting of equity returns provided initial property returns are good. Annual indexation plays a minor role and the yield cycle has a narrow band. So timing of entry and exit from this market determines largely whether one makes a gain or not, albeit equity returns are attractive. In the UK, we focused initially on developing student housing. 
with almost no rental indexation in this market, one has to create value in the upfront development or ride the yield cycle, which is generally stable, but unexciting. The market is extremely sophisticated and efficient, so there are limited opportunistic plays. Smart capital structures also allow fair equity returns for the, light risk, for, for the right risk categories. We are currently engaged in the senior living space, developing best in category accommodation again in London. We have an ambitious strategy in pipeline for this sector and will broaden our segmental spread and service offerings. In Australia, we're doing senior living in what they call the MHE sector on the Gold Coast and in boarding house developments in Sydney. In South Africa, outside of Zenprop, I'm involved in an affordable housing initiative, which is aiming to be the benchmark for this category of accommodation in a community environment. It's an empowerment initiative in the Cape Town Metro and mostly for rental, albeit some sales. Specific lessons that I'd like to just mention, particularly from my, um, my various um, businesses and various experiences. The most important recommendation I can give you is, is about the partner that you choose in business. You have to choose your partners really carefully. You must rigorously check them out. What do people say about them? How do they react under pressure? Have they run away from difficult situations? Have they faced up to them? How do they treat other people? Do they have bad habits? Speak to their ex-business partners, their suppliers, their service providers, people that work for them. Check their credit rating. What is their family set up? Are they religiously observant? What are their charitable pursuits? Engage openly with them on a value system. What's important to them? Do they have a code of behavior? What are their regula regulators or their guides? Do they have a life philosophy? If so, engage on it. What are their ambitions? Are they compatible with yours? What level of greed do they have? Are they likely to be easily tempted and to, and to be sidelined? The second most important aspect for me is, is alignment of interests. Be sure you have complete alignment of interests with your partners. Any non-alignment will ultimately lead to conflict, so it's best to avoid it. You must establish the correct capital structure for your business. You must develop strong relationships with your shareholders and funders and have absolute clarity on the extent and terms of their commitments to you. Document funding arrangements comprehensively and always have a plan B scenario if additional capital is needed for the business to sustain itself. Also establish the divorce agreement with your partners. Might be a strange thing, but business par partnerships aren't necessarily forever. They do end. Engage and agree on all the detailed terms of a divorce at the same time as you sign the initial shareholders agreement. Get competent legal and tax advice on these agreements. Identify your market niche, focus on it, and become the master of it. Learn everything there is to know about it. This endorses what Jeff has said. Irrespective of how small that market niche may be, Zenprop's initial focus in the office sector was the Santon CBD. And in the 22 years of doing business there, we've developed or redeveloped over 22 buildings, virtually one a year on average. And even today, we have two under construction. Have a bespoke human ethos in dealing with your customers. Everyone wants to, wants to feel special. Maintain regular human contact and keep appraised of their evolving business needs. Continuously innovate and improve your offerings to them. Understand what your customers value and develop insights, offerings and solutions based on these insights. Never stop innovating. Constantly review practices, processes, systems, seeking to improve, streamline, drive efficiency and contain costs. Adopt industry best practice as a norm across all aspects of your business. This will underpin your value retention and give you a competitive edge in tough times. Health and safety should be an entrenched core value as should being environmentally friendly. It's even more important now in the days of pandemics. Develop your critical support ecosystem. Become their best customer. Choose reliable, experienced, competent, honest people as service providers. Pay them on time and reward extra effort. Don't penny pinch. Treat them all as close family and with the utmost respect and listen carefully when they report issues. Hire the best, most competent key professional staff you can find and invest your time and effort in mentoring and guiding them. Treat them as partners, reward them handsomely, enough that the competitors can never afford to employ them. After all, they hold your IP. Assess their value systems as you would your partners and thoroughly check prime employment histories. Empower people through, de through delegating responsibility, making them accountable, and rewarding meeting targets and outperformance. Poor performance 
dishonest, irresponsible, and mischievous behavior should not be tolerated. If you decide to exit an asset, sell when you've made a decent profit. Or if you're facing a loss, sell when the loss you may have to sustain is manageable. Don't necessarily wait for a better offer, it may never come. Finally, I've been blessed to have been associated directly and indirectly with the development of over 5 million square meters of property covering virtually all segments of the property industry from South Africa to the UK, Germany, and Australia. All our businesses are today run by executive teams, I mentored over many years, and all of them are significant equity partners in the business, and I believe leaders in their fields of focus. The business operates as a large family and thoroughly embraces family values. And in case the message hasn't come across, our group mantra is innovation with excellence. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that, Rodney. And uh, just before I hand over to Ron, just a brief uh, question. Uh, Rodney, you mentioned you're a civil structure engineer and uh, Jeff, you're a CA. Um, just I'm saying, do you guys think that there's a, a trait or a skill set that you require or is needed to be a successful property investor or developer? And is there um, a trait that either of you possess that you think has led to your success in the property industry? Uh, maybe you can just shed some light on that. And then maybe we can just hand over to Ron who has a couple of questions as well. So the common denominator between Jeff and I is we were born in the same town. Um, for better oh, or worse. Yeah. So there's no hope you, for me, that's what you're saying. Pardon? So there's no hope for me, if that's what you're saying. <laughs> no, not at all. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, the sort of um, discipline was, was entrenched and instilled very young. I started working at 13 years old. I was required to. It wasn't an option. And I guess it was an approach of having to go through the ladder climb, do the nitty gritty, learn it all. Um, I'm not sure it makes any difference as to whether you're a CA or, a, uh, or an engineer, but I think attitude is a big thing. Um, never turn down a challenge, embrace it, do the best to, to beat it and to meet it. And accept the fact that, you know, 80% of work is, is grind, 20% of it is, is, is the light. Thanks. Jeff, is there anything you would like to add, maybe? Sorry, Jeff, you're on mute. Um, do you want to just maybe unmute yourself? I just want to repeat perhaps with, um, with, with, um, with what Rodney had to mention and echo his sentiments with regards to values. It has to be a value-based um, business. If those values are not there, um, then I don't think you've got sustainability. Um, the other one I, I just want to mention is grit. You need to make sure that that it's not it's not plain sailing. Um, it's tough. It's hard. Um, not to give up. Um, know what you want to do and just keep plugging away until and until and, and, and until it it, it uh, until it yields. Thanks, uh, Ron. You had Great. some questions. Sure. Thanks, Philly. Um, and thanks, Rodney and Jeff. You know, it's been really insightful listening to your guys' story and your respective, you know, experiences in, in, in the relevant industries. You know, just to revert back to tonight's topic of conversation, um, we, we're dealing with property in a post-COVID world. You know, I can't help to, to pick on what, what Rodney was mentioning, never turned down a challenge. And currently at the moment, you know, we all face it with an unforeseen challenge of a pandemic. You know, I just want to unpack that in terms of, property and, and relating it to your independent you know, respective industries perhaps Jeff, Jeff you can start what does it mean to you you know um, on three three sort of fronts um, firstly for for a developer um, and and then an entrepreneur looking to tap into the space and then perhaps you know the average property owner someone that owns a property and you know either owns a few that's earning a bit of a yield or looking to sell their own you know property to to free up some cash just on those three fronts um, perhaps you know, relating it back to COVID. Mm. I I don't want to duck out of the, the 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 question by saying I don't have a crystal ball and and, and so I, I don't know what what COVID what what COVID um, is going to bring. But it, it certainly requires a lot of a lot of thought. Um, the reason being is that COVID flies in the face of property because property uh, by its very nature is a place where people meet. And so how is this going to play out in the future? Uh, before, I, I, I just uh, I, I thought before, before um, and, and this is not necessarily um, thought through properly, but before this started, we were chatting. And I mentioned to you, I'd met somebody in Cape Town and he mentioned 
that at one stage when Cape Town was having these, these droughts, um, people really, really took the drought very seriously and, and, and built their own little reservoirs, these green Jojo um, uh, uh, tanks that, 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 that we, we've all seen. Um, and they were very careful with the amount of time spent in the shower, changing uh, uh, shower heads. But thank God, um, that too came to an end and the rains came and, our, and the Cape dams filled up. And today, not so very long afterwards, we're back to normal consumption. Uh, whether that will happen with with, with mm. COVID, um, I don't know. But one one, one has to one has to um, people are far more bug aware. Um, one has to work out how that that is 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 is, is going to is going going to roll out. But I, I I don't think COVID is the big the big question. Um, COVID too will end. Um, I think the bigger the bigger question mark is is on this country perhaps. Will South Africa recover in time? Yeah. Yeah, look, I think that's a you know very valuable point. You know, I can't help to to revert back to your original discussion that you mentioned something about, you know, in relation to devalued properties that you, you your father had picked up. Do you do you foresee that that period of time sort of reverting in terms of, you know, um, those devalued properties and some 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 people picking up, you know, uh, what is referred to as, you know, undervalued um, or underused properties that can now be put. Yeah, I, th I think there are going to be some guys that 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 that, that are, are going to do it, and, and, and please God, this country, which I think it will, will will survive. And those people that are moving now, and they've got the cash, I wouldn't advise somebody um, gearing themselves in, in in today's environment. Just 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 something else. I worry. I'm not an interest rate man, but. I worry about interest rates. Interest rates are, are low. I, I'm in the 30 years I'm doing this, I've never seen interest rates at at at, at these at these kind uh, are kind of levels. And, and 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 I think they're there because government has to introduce some some something to to try stimulate the economy. Um, but if you look at, at 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 swap curves, for example, you can still get cheap money uh, for about and, and and I was discussing it today with with our my financial guy um, for about 18 months, one, one and a half years. But after that, the, the, the curve starts rising quite quickly. So don't think that um, the, the availability of cheaper property together with low interest rates um, is, is, is the ideal combination to get stuck in and, and, and really hock yourself to heel, hilt. I think that, that, could be, that could be a mistake going forward. I don't know whether we answered the question well enough. Yeah, I think you. I think you covered it really great. I think, you know, that's I suppose from a residential perspective, and perhaps you can just touch a touch on perhaps a retail perspective. You know, obviously now we're in such a digital transformation environment, and you know the retail space. You know, what does that high street shopping look like at the moment? Um, perhaps your thoughts on that. So I, 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 I told you, I, I, I know a little bit, I guess, about high street shopping. I know little, very really little about, about the malls. But when I walk in the malls, I, 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 I see problems. Um, whether that will continue or not, I don't have a, a, a crystal ball. Um, but I, I sense that the problems that we had here in South Africa, um, we had um, SDN de Klerk um, doing, I think, a reasonable job pulling together as property guys and representing us against um, many retailers, um, and and I think that that they didn't they, they they did make progress, I guess, but it wasn't easy, and the reason was the retailers are genuinely struggling. Uh, the retailers mm -hmm. can't afford the total cost of occupation in these fancy shopping centres. I think the shopping centres in South Africa perhaps may be a bit too expensive. Uh, and, and so the retailers themselves push back against the the um, against uh, against the demand of many of these the bigger the bigger uh, REITs. Um, and in that process, um, some of us guys got got hurt. You know, they say when America sneezes, the rest of the world gets hurt. And I think there could be an element there. I'm not saying to use plain sailing for um, the 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 high street. Um, the high street shops, but I can tell you, in the prime areas, I don't have vacancies. Um, there's, there's one big one that I that I, I, I worry about that I've had for too long, 
Uh, and, and I think yesterday they concluded a, a big deal on, on this high street shopping. Um, it was a big brand that's coming into the CBD of Pretoria because they understand the power, the footfall of these people. No, look, I suppose I agree. You know, I suppose things have to carry on. Um, uh, people have to move on and carry on doing as their, their core business focus is. Um, you know, so, you know, that sounds great. I think just to move over to Rodney um, on the more of, you know, the commercial industrial sort of side, you know, what are your thoughts on, on that in a post-COVID world? You know, the big corporate life in terms of, you know, the office spaces and the digital transformation in terms of remote working, you know, what are your views in that environment? Is it going to flip into uh, exactly where we were before, where everyone was comfortable in, in that corporate culture? Or is that going to adapt? Um, you know, I suppose, obviously, we, we can't, as uh, you know, predict the future. But, you know, a man of your, your experience would, you know, it'd be interesting to hear your views. Yeah, so I think um, possibly because I sit, you know, in the UK most of the time and I kind of look in and I see many markets and I read an enormous amount and I get fed a lot of information about this COVID thing. It, um, I find it less intimidating, I think, than some people do. Um, I think that the media frenzy has possibly been overplayed. And I think there's a lot of question marks on the, on the science that was behind it. And I think if you want a balanced view as to really what it's all about, there's, there's some interesting um, webinars on YouTube that you could go to. There's a professor, um, Michael Levitt from Stanford University, who's worth listening to. Uh, the two Swedish uh, epidem epidemiology experts are worth listening to, Prof Giesecke and I'm not sure the other guy, what the other guy's name is. Their view, frankly, is that COVID is an extremely bad flu with specific targeted um, people who are vulnerable. And it's generally been badly managed. Um, but there's a lot of lessons learned and there is a predictable trend to it. So the mortality that's come through so far is, is high clearly and, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's concerning, but it's not that much more than a seasonal flu influence. So taking that into account, and obviously in dealing with various businesses that I do and trying to get a measure of what's this going to do to obviously our portfolio, which is spread across many, many sectors, number one, and looking at specific markets, I've kind of taken a view as to where I think it's going to go and how we need to plan our future. And I think it's different for different sectors. And if you want, I've actually jotted down some notes on the various um, sectors in that I think will be affected in South Africa and the way I see it potentially unfolding. Um, clearly, it's kind of, it's a little bit of, um, you know, sort of stargazing here or crystal ball gazing, but I'm not as scared about it or intimidated about it as perhaps I should be. And that's probably because I've been through a lot of down cycles in my career. You know, 40 years in the business, I've seen a lot of ups and downs. And the one thing I do know is that Humans are incredibly resourceful, incredible creative, and humans that are educated, and our, our community particularly, which is cohesive, is able to find its way around and find opportunity. Um, we've always made money in tough times by positioning ourselves correctly. We haven't made the money in the tough times, but we set the base for it. And I don't see this as being any different. Um, yes, there are a lot more unpredictabilities, and I think there are going to be a lot more changes. I don't for a second think things will be the same as they were. I think there's going to be a new norm. In the office market specifically, um, South Africa has already gone through a real tough contraction in the office market over the last five years. There's been um, large vacancy growth. There's been a lot of consolidation and integration from corporates. Uh, and rentals have been under pressure. There've been negative reversions in a lot of places. Uh, the technology has certainly changed the way people can work. Will people adopt that as a, as a blanket strategy? I somehow don't think so. I think certain businesses will, particularly maybe the tech businesses, where they can have people working remotely and they don't really need to build corporate cultures. I think where businesses have corporate cultures that are um, core to their, to their business, I think it's very hard, if not impossible, to do that online. I think that has to be done in a, in a collaborative environment. So that's the one aspect. The other aspect is that 
the, the kind of things I'm seeing statistically or, or with actual numbers, the coming out of Japan, Fujitsu, for example, they are going to halve their demand. They, they're cutting their, their office space by 50%, but they are a technology business, so they can do it. And they're a massive user, 80,000 80, people. Um, the banking sector people that I've been engaging with here, they are going to a, a three days on, two day, or three days in, two days out policy. So three days a week, you have to be in the office. Two days a week, you don't have to be. And it's on a rotational basis. And that's part of their, their culture requirement. I speak to people that are, um, that, are, that are sort of employees and I ask them, how do they feel? Without exception, they've all said to me, they can't wait to get back to meeting their friends, meeting their colleagues. None of them are happy sitting at home. Okay. They all quote this business of having an interaction over a cup of coffee or over a croissant. They all speak about the, the fact that um, entrepreneurial innovation happens in a collaborative environment. A particular energy erupts when you are together in a group of people. It's different when you're online. It's just not the same. You don't get that eye contact. You can't read the emotions as, as clearly. So my view is that I don't think we're going to see a, a calamity here. Um, I think we're going to see a, a reduction in increase, that's for sure. And I think we, there will be a consolidation. I think the, as usual, in times like this, the, the better quality product always does better than the poorer quality product. I think there's going to be huge opportunity for entrepreneurs because I think there will be vacancies that are extended beyond the vacancies that existed pre-COVID that will be exacerbated. And I think the, the business of doing change of use is going to be an enormous, exciting opportunity for a lot of people. And that will happen throughout the, uh, the South African market. Obviously, one needs to ch choose one's notes carefully and understand the market that you're going into carefully. But I think with the pressure of exactly what Jeff mentioned earlier is footfall, you're going to find, I believe, mixed use becoming the sort of dominant um, move in all the big commercial conurbations. CBDs by definition are like that. Jeff's gone a, a long way in his business to, to bring people into the city in Pretoria. I think the same thing's going to happen in Santon. It's certainly happened in Cape Town. It's going to happen more and more. So I think therein lies massive opportunity. Um, and I think it's opportunity that is tangible to young energetic developers. Uh, they're sizable enough for them to be exciting. They're not too big that they're going to be unaffordable and out of reach, you know, with sensible sort of syndication or partnering. So I see a lot of opportunity there. I was reading an article this morning about in America, they are converting hotels to office use with that product. Okay. They're basically going the WeWork concept with, mm. with hotels. So the, this ability to morph the use of a space is very exciting to me. And I think a lot of opportunity is going to be presented there. I suppose the same concept is also, you know, where you have homeowners converting their own houses to, to workspaces as like corporates in that sort of sense. So, you know, I suppose yep. it's of similar nature. Um, I can't help to, to revert to something, Rodney. You, you, you proposed a question in, in the beginning of the discussion over to Jeff, but it's quite interesting. Um, it was something, in, you know, you said, do you think, and this is obviously to you, Jeff, the future in residential housing is social housing, you know? Perhaps you, you know, just want to touch on the question. Obviously, I know I'm taking your your thunder here, Rodney, but just proposing it to Jeff. Are you speaking to me or to Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> speaking to Jeff, you know, obviously okay. reverting using your question. <laughs> so, so, so you need you need to help me uh, just a little bit. I, I, I think that 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 here in South Africa we play um, quite a bit in in, in the res inner city. Um, uh, residential space and people use terms and I think quite interchangeably without them realizing so there's something called um, affordable housing something called inner city uh, living there's something called um, uh, social housing so you would just help me what exactly do you mean by social housing so for me um, I, I still don't call it social housing by the way I call it affordable housing I think that where you can, from a rental point of view, um, you're probably looking at, I would say, starting at about three and a half to four and a half thousand rand a month. 
for accommodation. I won't define the accommodation and possibly up to as high as even 12,000 a month. But the bulk of it, the sweet spot being around six and a half to eight is where I would call it sort of, um, it's, it's in the value space more. And in terms of capital cost, I believe it's well under the 2 million mark. I think it's actually sub one and a half million. And I think it's more and more pressing down towards sub 1.2 million. And probably in the 800,000 to 1.2 million rand range is where I think the bulk of the demand is going to be. But anyway. So I, I, I would agree with that, uh, Rodney. It's interesting that um, those people that research this market of all the sectors ranging from, I don't want to go right to the, 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 the below three and a half thousand rand because that's that's uh, subsidized housing really. You can't you can't build anything at, at three and less than a, a rental of three and a half thousand rand. But from three and a half thousand rand, you just 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 start to 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 show some kind of decent um, return. Um, but the, the the research for some time now has said has mentioned that from about three and a half four thousand up until the number I think you mentioned eight thousand, that is the sweet spot in terms of uh, two issues. Number one, the timing of the payment and the incidence of bad debts. That's the best place to be. Yeah, and I, and I think that I, 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 for me, um, what is quite interesting, it's only those people that play in that space understand that space. You can hear it. You can read it, you yeah. can be told about it, but you need to play there yeah. to, to to realize that this is um, goes. I, I, I just want to, on the side, Rodney, between me and you, you mentioned uh, to me when you started, it was interesting hearing you talking about COVID, but before that you spoke that we both came from, from the same time. I'm, so, I'm, 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 I'm assuming you from Pretoria. I, did, I didn't know that. But there's oh, yeah. another person that you don't know, perhaps, it's also from Pretoria, and that's one of the scientists that you mentioned, Michael Levitt. I know that. that. Do you know that? Went, okay. went to the same school. <laughs> it's, 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 okay. It, me as well. The same school. I'm sending my kids to that school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There must be something in the tap water there. So look, I mean, for what it's worth, I really think that there's massive potential in this residential market. I think it's, it's going to become more and more a central play for everybody, including the commercial retail operators. And I think it, it presents a huge opportunity for, for youngsters to get in and across the spectrum. I mean, if you talk about, let's just get down to somebody, you know, with sort of starting out. I've looked at areas in Santon, for example, places like Benmore, Benmore Gardens, uh, Wendy Wood, um, Sandown, those areas where the stands are relatively small, they're very close to the Santon CBD, the pricing you can probably acquire there from what I gather um, with, you know, with careful negotiation, you're probably going to pick up properties there well under the 2 million rand mark. Um, that's massive value, you know. Um, you can do a modest refurbishment on it. You can maybe live in it and for a while and you definitely be able to rent it out and possibly see some sort of value growth. I think that more and more value is going to be driven by access to these big conurbations. People are going to want to walk. People are going to want to live, work, play. That's where the whole world's going, you know? And I think with things like the, I believe there was a, there was a sudden increase in taxi uh, fares in, in Alexandra a couple of weeks ago. They just doubled the fare. People are more and more walking. So I think you're going to find people from Alexandra, you know, trying to get accommodation closer to where they work. Now, what I was talking about earlier, which is this ability to, to change use in existing buildings, particularly the older buildings where you can go high density and you can add on top of them because the structures are quite heavy. So you can bulk up. Um, there are these new uh, regulations, as you know, within the, the town planning scheme, which allows you to go to smaller size units. I think there's massive opportunity sticking out there. I think it needs to be researched properly, but it's certainly there. Ronnie, can I just jump in there? So obviously there's a big debate amongst the my friend group and this was even someone else. It's whether to buy or rent obviously with low interest rates and the ability to now try to get a, a cheap rental bargain, you know, what do you do? You want to leave home or as a first time buyer, do you buy a property or do you rent a property? And then obviously just going on to your point, I'm saying there's a lot of conversions in the Santa node of, of micro units and the scenes, everyone's talking about it overseas of micro unit apartments, co-living, co-working. Do you think the South African economy and South African population um, 
can actually live in a 15 or 18 square meter apartment. It's not part of our culture. Um, is walking really a big thing and saying, are we ready for something like that? And maybe Jeff, I mean, you, the retail, uh, the residential experts, if you can also share some light on that. So I, 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 I think that um, I, I, we, we do play with it. We do look at it. We haven't done much. Uh, I think once you get below uh, 17, 18, you, you, I think that the guys would describe it here as being nano units. Um, and, and generally, one the people that are doing nano units here in South Africa, and there are, or there are some, and I've seen it, it's just not of a great quality. Um, the, the, the stuff that we, we, we like to do probably starts at about, I don't know, 18 to, to, to 25 squares for a, for a bachelor unit. And, and, and that market that, that, that's happy to stay there um, is, 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 is very happy. I I've never heard one, anybody complain about the, about the size. I think what is more relevant in this market is, is the pricing. If you can bring, like Rodney suggested, something into the market at, um, uh, you're going to battle to do it, I think, at three and a half, but certainly at four, four and a half, somewhere around there, which I think is affordable. When I'm talking about four, four and a half, I'm, 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 I'm saying excluding, excluding utilities, um, and I think which is important in today's world, but it's still expensive to bring um, data into, into, into your into your yeah. uh, building, there's, there is a, a um, there is a there is a demand. I, I, I think there's some interesting stuff happening now in the inner city of of Johannesburg um, that that that's well designed. It's quite it's quite hip hop, uh, and 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 really really um, sought after. But I think the big question mark for me, um, once again, is, is around um, unemployment. Um, if, 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 if we can see unemployment coming down, um, that's where you want to be. Agreed. And, and Rodney, your thoughts on bar to rent as a youngster starting out leaving home? So if I take my kids as an example and I look at how, they, how their lives have evolved, I think the one lesson I learned is that you need to be really sure of what your career path is going to be if you start committing to buying a property. Um, I'm talking about property for living, okay, and for, for as a first-time buyer or as a, as a couple. Because it is an illiquid asset, you're not going to sell a property easily, and particularly in this environment, even if you're buying at good value, there's no guarantee that you're going to get growth in value over the next, for me, over the next, med over the medium term even. So the, it's very restrictive if you own a piece of real estate in terms of your career path. If you decide you want to go and you know, do, a, do a, a year study in the US, now you're stuck with a bond over here, you have to be able to sublet the thing, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's the first decision. Do you want to, are you pretty sure that you're going to be in that place for, a, I would say five years is the minimum kind of threshold you should set as a commitment if you're going to buy a piece of real estate. Having said that, if you're going to do it, then I think this is probably as good a time as there is. Interest rates are low. Um, the the comparison between the cost of a bond and the cost of rental is pretty much the same from the figures I've seen. Yeah. Um, there is the issue of having to raise the deposit and how you raise that deposit um, is a factor. Frankly, I think there's a massive business potential in creating that kind of a product. In other words, providing deposits for people who want to own, okay? Um, provided you manage and control the quality and the type of the asset that you make available to them under those kind of scenarios. Um, so I think, you know, people want to own their piece of real estate at the end of the day. There are very people, few people who say they want to rent all their lives. It's not our, it's not our culture. Our culture is, you know, in Germany, 70% of people rent and have rented all their lives. In South Africa, people have traditionally owned. Uh, it hasn't made sense to own over the last five years, frankly. I mean, you've just lost money. In fact, probably over the last 10 years. Um, certainly in the market over 3 million, I think you've lost money. In the market under 2 million, you may have been okay. So again, if you're buying in that segment, and for me, it's under 2 million, and you're buying value, and you can make a commitment that's, a, as I say, a five-year commitment with confidence, then I think you probably, you've got to think serious about buying. It is a, it is a compelling argument. But as I say, that's, that's the big issue, is the, is the mobility. And then if you do buy, you must buy cleverly. You must buy with 
keeping in mind that you may want to rent the property out because you may not be able to sell it. So you'd have to, you know, bear that in mind and do the conversion, whatever the, the upgrades are, bearing that in mind. The other thing, of course, you've got to remember is if you're a couple and you're thinking of kids, kids change, this, change the, the, the space demands. And is that going to be adequate? So you need to consider that. Interesting. Interesting. Thanks. Thanks, Rodney. And thanks, Jeff, for your insights on that. You know, guys, we, we, we're we going to be wrapping up sh shortly. Um, uh, we're heading over the, the, the nine o'clock time. I, I know it, it felt like five minutes to me, but um, obviously we all have our evenings to get to. Just to sign off the evening and before, you know, extend our gratitude and thanks to, to Jeff and Rodney himself. Um, perhaps just two minutes of inspiration, you know, to the audience to, you know, in the regions of 25 to, to mid 40s. Um, looking to, you know, that are interested in the property sector, as well as, you know, perhaps just a holistic general inspiration to leave us with a good taste for the end of the week. Um, perhaps you can start, Jeff. Mm. I, I, this is this is very hard, and I, I you did you did give me this to me. Um, I, I wasn't able to find um, anything inspirational, but but to say this that. Um, I don't know. I don't. I told you I don't have a crystal ball. Um, but one does have to be be positive. Uh, if, if if one's not positive, what 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 are we doing here? Um, so I think that that we have to be positive. And logically, if we are positive, then then surely for a youngster wanting to 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 get involved, this is the, this is the best time. Uh, just just I want to add something to what Rodney perhaps said, and 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 that is. Um, uh, uh, I've had involvement in 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 in, uh, in early days with Jaffa, which is the Jewish old uh, the Jewish old age home uh, in Pretoria, and and what was what was interesting there, and I think it's still of application. Those people that had property, owned property in their lives, um, they were okay. They could go to Jaffa, and I think to any 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 old age home um, with with capital. Those people that didn't own property but rented. Um, they, 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 they suffered, and 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 the community had to come by and 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 assist them. Um, so I guess what I'm saying to you is that property is a force saving, uh, and and that in, in that respect, provided you you've listened to what Rodney, I think Rodney expressed it very well, and you're able to buy smartly, and and you can try anticipate uh, what you need um, and grow when the market grows, um, and not to be caught out and find yourself in a situation where the market's taken off and rocketed and you left behind, you're going to be in trouble. My view. Sure. I think that's more than, uh, more than inspirational to say the least, not just that in the fact that what you've said tonight has been, you know, inspirational as a whole. So I think just to put the cherry on top, that was great. Thanks, Jeff. Rodney, um, just two words of inspiration. Yeah, look, I must endorse what Jeff said. I mean, being positive is the most important thing. If you want to be a property developer, you have to be positive by definition. Okay, you can't look backwards. Um, I just want to endorse. I just want to repeat two things that I think are quite critical. The one is this, this business of knowledge. As I said to you, knowledge is power. That's the most important thing getting into this business. As I say, find a, a, a narrow, small market, but become the master of that. Okay. Um, and the second thing is, don't be scared to ask for advice. The one mistake people make is they think they've got to, they have all the answers or they think they've got to take risks that are, and they should not necessarily be taking. There are a lot of old guys in the market like myself, like Jeff, who are available there. And we are very happy to, to talk and mentor guys who have, are serious about what they're doing. Okay. Um, don't be scared to ask answers. Don't be, ask questions. Don't be embarrassed about making a fool of yourselves at all. Okay. Ask the questions. It can save you a lot of trouble. Um, and the, the, you guys, and, and don't be shy of innovation. Don't be shy of innovation. Don't be scared of disrupting things. That's what the world's all about. You youngsters have an advantage in that. You are. One of my guys said to me the other day, "I am. I was born in the computer era. I think computers. My brain works like a computer. They think analytics. They think um, digitization. They think, um, you know, processes and routines and systems." That gives you a massive advantage, gives you access to channels that we never had access to. I think there's huge opportunity for you guys in, in taking advantage of what technology offers you that we haven't, old guys like us haven't even thought of. 
you know. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's lots of reason for um, for being positive. And obviously, just look at the demographics in South Africa. I mean, if you look at the population growth statistics, and you look at the age statistics, the age pyramid, it gives you a lot lots of uh, food for encouragement. Let me tell you. Yes, the country needs to get on its feet economically, but I think there's more than enough pressure from from every angle to guide and direct that that's going to be happening. The chances of that happening, I think, is better than it's not happening. The fact that people like me, who frankly could afford not to have to invest in South Africa, still do and still commit there and still have massive commitments there. And that people from overseas, you know, Europeans, British people, German people, Americans are investing in there has to tell you something. Amazing. And uh, Rodney, thank you very much for those, those inspiring words. And Jeff, uh, thank you very much for your time. Both of you are really inspirational. Um, there's lots of learnings that we can both take out of it. And once again, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to hand over to Aaron, who will wrap up and will obviously, I think, just um, discuss who our next speaker is next week and tomorrow night. So once again, thank you very much from my side. And hopefully we'll have you back soon. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Rodney. Appreciate it. Um, really great to listen to you guys and learn. Awesome. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, what a privilege it's been. Rodney and Jeff, thank you for giving us your time, expertise, and inspiration. It truly was insightful. So thank you. Pleasure. Uh, everyone who's zoomed in, thank you. Please see our upcoming webinars and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.